Great Sabbath day, folks. I've got the pleasure of having someone I've known for nearly 45 years now uh, with me today. And uh, she's here for an additional witness uh, on this uh, word study video we're doing today. And uh, I'm going to ask her to say hello to everybody. Go ahead, ma'am. Hello and shalom to all. That's my lovely wife, Tanya, of 42 years. And uh, anyway, so this video study is going to be on alchemy in the Philosopher's Stone. So let's get started. So believing involves holding a conviction or acceptance of something as true. Even in the absence of concrete evidence, Knowing refers to having factual information or evidence about something that is true and verifiable. So a lot of times we believe in things, but we believe just because we might have heard it and we never did go out and test and prove it. But knowing is taking factual information or evidence and going out and verifying it and stuff at that point in time. So that's what we, we need to have more than belief. We have to have knowledge uh, that it is, it holds to be true. So this study, uh, we're going to uh, try to cover these uh, topics here. What is alchemy? Our testimony, Tanya and my testimony, is there righteous and unrighteous alchemy? Is righteous alchemy scriptural? And what is the philosopher's stone? So what is alchemy? So when we pull this up, and I just Google this, I put in alchemy definition, and it pulls up here the medieval, medieval forerunner of chemistry based on the supposed transformation of matter. It was concerned, it was concerned particularly with attempts to convert base metals into gold or to find universal elixir occult sciences such as alchemy and uh, astrology. So anyway. I want, you, I want everybody to um, look at this. It says to convert base metals and keep that in mind as we go through this study. And supposed here, when I looked that up at, etymologically, the origin of it means regarded or received as true, believed or thought to exist. So it doesn't have anything to be, have knowledge of. It just, it has a supposed or um, someone assumes uh, that it to be true, regards it to be true. And uh, if you look at the origin of alchemy, it says the art of transmuting metals. Again, metals being key to this study here. Now we take a lecture and look at a lecture. It will tie into medicinal, but it's a, it says here a magical or medicinal potion. An elixir guaranteed to induce love. That's another thing that's going to be a part of this Study, I want y'all to key in on it. An elixir, which is part uh, a, a root of alchemy, is guaranteed to in, induce love. And then we have a particular type of medicinal solution, a cough elixir. So everybody, I believe, uh, possibly, and I'm not going to say everybody, but most people have taken some type of cough suppressant, whether it be natural or pharmaceutical. Um, and I've been, I've, I've done both throughout my history of my life. So in, in the origin of the elixir, another thing I want to key in on is powder for drying wounds. So this is going to be an interesting, uh, study powder for drying wounds. And there was so much I learned by doing this study and doing these, uh, deeper word searches. I think, uh, everybody's going to get, uh, some great enjoyment out of it. Uh, medicinal um, of a substance or plant having healing properties uh, such as medicinal herbs. And um, Tony and I, over the last several years, we've been using uh, medicinal herbs. Uh, tony has got a herbal drawer <laughs> and, a, a, and a, a medicinal herb cabinet uh, that is just full of all kinds of uh, herbs and um, minerals and uh, well, we got some essential oils mm -hmm. and everything else that um, we use throughout our uh, uh, daily lives. Uh, we don't use everything every day, but we do pull it out in instances um, where we need some extra uh, help uh, with our health and such. So, and then we have here medicinal also talks about relating to or involving medicines or drugs. Um, 
Drugs, we really want to stay away from. Uh, as far as medicine, I'm okay with the medicine, depending on what the medicine comes from. And then we have medicine here, so we'll take a look at that in the next screen. In medicine, the science or practice of the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease. And again, that's something Tony and I have been very serious in over the last several years. I, I think it started, when did it start? When we removed our microwave years ago. And, um, and we found that the microwave wasn't good, not only for, you know, what it does to our food and removing a lot of the, uh, um, the uh, benefits of what the food has in it by the way it heats it up. It loses those benefits, but also the fact of what the radio uh, transmission that the uh, microwave puts out. So we, we haven't had a microwave since, I guess, 2000 or 2001, somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, um, that's that's part of medicine. Then we got here a compound or preparation used for the treatment or prevention of a disease, especially a drug or drugs taken by the mouth. Again, uh, that's something that we really uh, try to stay away from as far as uh, the drug industry. Um, again, it says here healing substances of drugs. And then number three here, it says, especially among some North American Indian peoples, which I'm uh, Tanya happens to be uh, of the Sioux Indian uh, bloodline, and um, her ancestry probably did some of these things with uh, with uh, the uh, created spells and charms or fetish believed to have healing, protective, or other powers. So we know a lot of the Indian practices had a lot of the um, med uh, medicinal uses of herbs and, and things like that. So uh, uh, we understand that true, but, the, you know, there's also some portions of... Uh, uh, there, I call it bad medicine, like it says here, uh, where they use it uh, for spells and charms or, or, or fetishes uh, at that point in time. So when we look at al alchemy under the um, etymology, um, we get me medieval chemistry, the supposed science of transmutation of base metals into silver or gold, involving also the quest for the universal solvent. So let me read that again. It's the supposed, again, supposed. So it's not based on fact. It's based on a, somebody supposing a supposed science of transmutation of base metals into silver or gold. So it's into silver and go, or gold, not vice versa. It's not silver going back, you know, um, into the person or the gold going back into the person here it's talking about transmutation of base metals into the silver or gold um, but into a universal solvent quintessence etc so this universal uh, solvent is just talking about it just um, covers all things uh, at that point in time uh, I forget the word I, I meant to try to remember or put it on this slide and I failed to do that uh, but I'll carry on here. It was mid 14th century from Greek uh, chemia found in round about 300 uh, AD in a degree in a decree of Di Diocletian against the old writings of true Egyptians, all meaning alchemy and of uncertain origin. So Diocletian was an emperor of Rome. Um, he was big into killing the believers of the Messiah. Um, and not only that, he was against the old writings of the Egyptians. So not everything that come out, comes out of Egypt, especially way back in the past, was necessarily had to be bad. Uh, there was things that the Egyptians did that were good. In fact, if you remember, Moses lived as an Egyptian for a, a large portion of his life. And uh, let's see, perhaps from an old name of, for Egypt, Chemia, literally land of black earth found in Plutarch, or from the Greek uh, Kymatos, that which is poured out from kind to pour, from pie root goo uh, to pour. And then Watkins in brackets here, it says Watkins, but Klein citing W. Mus Arnott calls this folk etymology. So um, Klein kind of disagrees with the Watkins deal. Uh, the word seems to have elements of both origins. And then Mon concludes after an elaborate investigation that Greek Chemia was probably the original being first applied to pharmaceutical chemistry, which was chiefly concerned with juices or infusions of plants. So again, we've learned 
uh, by doing our research that uh, when somebody uh, contracts the uh, the disease of um, c cancer, a lot of times uh, that uh, if somebody goes to juicing or going plant-based in their diet, that the cancer goes away. And we've got a wonderful testimony of my own sister um, that she went this route uh, a little well over four years ago now. And um, anyway, she went to she changed her diet and her lifestyle uh, because they had found a tumor on her thyroid. Was it Tanya on her thyroid? And my family has a history of having thyroid issues. So um, because of what my sister did uh, with her diet and lifestyle, I changed mine too. And I've got, you know, my witness is that I feel so much better since I changed uh, my lifestyle and my diet since then. And then it goes on to say here that the pursuits of the Alexandrian alchemist were a subsequent development of chemical study and that the notoriety of these may have caused the name of the art to be properly properly associated with the ancient name of Egypt. And that comes from the um, uh, Oxford English Dictionary there. And this is interesting here. Listen to this. The all, the A-L, is the Arabic def definite article, the, the art and the name were adopted by the Arabs from the Alexandrians. So the Alexandrians uh, were the ones from Greek, uh, the, the Grecian Empire, the Alexandrians, and entered Europe via Arabic Spain. Alchemy was the chemistry of the Middle Ages and early modern times, involving both occult, which that's the dark side of it, and then, of course, the natural philosophy and philosophy, I learned something new about that word. Uh, is a very interesting. I'll share here later. And practical chemistry and metal, metallurgy. I believe that's how you say that. After around about 1600, the strictly scientific sense went with chemistry. And alchemy was left with the sense of pursuit of the transmutation of baser metals into gold. So it goes... So it went from alchemy into chemistry, so it just became chemistry in the older sense was left with a sense of pursuit of the transmutation of baser metals into code. Search for the universal solvent and the panacea. So there you go. If you want to stop the video and study this out more for yourself, go right ahead. Uh, but I'm going to continue on. So this is our testimony. So a few years back, and this was before... Um, we had a major uh, health issue happen in our lives. Uh, we came across uh, what they call Ormus Gold. And uh, so we had bought some and we took some and we had, uh, Tanya took some. Uh, we had some friends that uh, we knew that also they took some. And this Ormus Gold, uh, believe it or not, you can actually, you can harvest it out of the earth itself. It's uh, uh, just you know, there, I think you have to uh, dig some dirt out of the ground, put some magnets in it, and then stir it, and then it will separate. The Ormus gold will separate um, into um, another, and I believe that's how they harvest it to this day. Um, and here's, I wanted to share the scientific scrutiny. So keep in mind, this is modern science, so they're not always worried about uh, our health naturally. They're more concerned with uh, their pocketbook and what they can make from there. Uh, so scientific scrutiny, while the benefits of gold nanoparticles in medicine and technology are supported by ongoing research and applications, the claims regarding monoatomic mono gold's health and spiritual benefits largely stem from anecdotal evidence and historical text rather than rigorous scientific studies. So I don't believe they've ever actually done a clinical study on the health benefits of Ormus Gold. So we just, what we have today is we just have um, other people's uh, that's used it, their testimony. And then of course, we look back in history and find other places where they might've said what Ormus Gold did for them. Then we got the lack of empirical evidence. Despite the intriguing historical and anecdotal reports, there is a significant lack of empirical evidence to conclusively support many of the health and psychic benefits at attributed to monoatomic gold consumption. So again, guys, over the last, you know, since 2020, we should be thinking a little bit different about who's, um, who's concerned about our, uh, our true health and such. So I would suggest, 
we all get a little bit more educated into a more natural way of uh, keeping ourselves healthy, healthy instead of going uh, to a their 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 scientific way of doing things. So this about tell, tell me uh, before we go on, Tanya. Tell me on the Ormus Code. Uh, I do vaguely remember I it it my my I, I did t- tend to have a. Uh, more dreams during that period of time where we were consuming some more gold. What was some of the things that you noticed when you were taking any of it? Well, the dreams I had was very vivid. I could remember them very clearly. Um, I felt like when I read the word, the scriptures, I could understand it in a sense to where it was more, um, more, it, more easier for, in some ways, you know, a little clearer to more you, clearer to yeah. me, of um, how uh, Yahuwah was speaking to me in the through the word, and um, I didn't really have a lot. It was really like it was like you were like in a fasting mode, physically fasting. Um, I didn't really have a lot of like. My body wasn't really hungry for 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 real food, you know. My my appetite it was more like a uh, kind of like an appetite uh, suppressant kind of. Um, now I did eat, you know, um, but it, I didn't feel like I needed to eat in some ways. But I did eat, you know. I thought, well, I better eat a little something, you know. And um, but that was basically more of how my body um, reacted to it. And that was over four years ago, maybe five years ago. So it's been a quite a while, but I felt like I had, like I said, more of a vivid, um, clearer, more insight of things. Okay. Well, good. Uh, yeah, and, and, and we know, you know, I've shared you know, multiple things uh, through email and and, and other uh, media, uh, social media sites with uh, where I've shared uh, information where, you know, we know there's a concerted effort um, to alter our pineal gland, which is the front, what I believe scripturally is the frontless of our eyes. It's, um, it's how we do, it's where all our thinking, where our clear thinking happens happens and if if there's calcium on your pineal gland it tends to alter your ability to clearly uh think properly so again there's there's foods that we can eat there's there's herbs that we can take there's um uh essential oils that we can do is there anything else tanya uh, other than herbs and essential oils and foods that you can think of that can well hey we uh we we uh earth we we take off our shoes and we do at least 10 or 15 minutes a day with our feet on the ground um we we stare at the sun either my i mainly do it in the morning you do it more in the evening but we know that there's a lot of health benefits uh with the sun helping or just just spending a large part of your time out during the day, not necessarily staring at the sun, but just being out in sunlight. We know that um, we've, um, because we've learned so much about the healing aspects of the sun that, uh, you know, it uh, makes us less susceptible to uh, uh, to sunburns and such. We tan easier and such. Uh, I don't think I had a sunburn one and I think I'm probably tanner than I've ever been in my my entire life this summer and um, so we have a lot of things there we have um, you know um, what else Um, you know there's some uh, lymphatic exercises we can do there's all kinds of health benefits that we can learn how to do to help us um, you know uh, cleanse ourselves a, eternally and get get rid of a lot of these calcium. So me and Tanya did the uh, the amazing uh, liver and gallbladder flush. Mm-hmm. I think I don't remember how many times you did it. I did, I did mine a year. in a year. Mm-hmm. It took me a year and a half to get rid of all my stones inside of me. Uh, but uh, but anyway, um, 
and again, that was just a blessing from somebody else that we um, fellowship with that had recommended us take a look into it. And uh, we were pleasantly surprised. And then we did feel a, a tremendous change in our um, our gut health, health mainly. And I think our gut is so important to how healthy we are and such. So um, anyway, so there's a lot of things we can do to stay healthy. So uh, so then we came across, uh, Tony worked at a health food store, so she was already familiar with uh, Colossal Silver. But I'm going to share here, this is National Center of Complementary and Integrative Health.gov. So it's the NCCIH, um, uh, National Institute of Health.gov. Um, what is Colossal Silver good for? So that's one of the questions I asked it. And it says, what, what is Colossal Silver used for? Colossal Silver was used to treat infections and wounds before antibiotics became available. So keep in mind, guys, our body are full of good, we're supposed to keep good biotics in our body. And if you take the today's pharmaceutical antibiotics, it kills even your good biotics, bad biotics and good biotics. So, uh, but what the caudal silver does it's antimicrobial if you do your research on it and you'll see it's uh it doesn't tear you up like a, a pharmaceutical antibiotic does and then of course they continue on here and says there is no cl clinical evidence supporting the use of colloidal silver to prevent or treat you know the old uh, uh, stuff that came around four years ago so we have that information there so this comes down to who do you trust now they do put out enough truth out there uh, that we can get information like this uh, but our testimony and i'm gonna let tanya she went back further on the caudal silver and then i'll step in when i kind of got familiar with it myself and i'll be a second witness for tanya but tanya when was the first time that we ever used it health wise for on anything whether it be uh, an animal or ourselves when when was the first time you remember well when when i was working at the health food store it's been over since i started in 2012 and i i quit in 2014. i learned so much about what the silver could do people were using it for pink eye any type of infection in their eyes and these were customers coming in and, mm -hmm. and giving you the their yeah. their witness or their testimony of what it did for them mm -hmm. also ear infection any type of wound infection they sell it in a liquid as well as a gel a cream um just it was just it's just really great stuff that our creator um put here for for our bodies to be able to heal um and how we so treated I, some of our animals yeah so the, when we first moved here which was in 2016 in cooterville yeah um we had we have a gray cat and it took us a month to, to trap her from the other house to bring her here because she was she's kind of skittish and stuff and we get her here and she got sick and she wouldn't eat she wouldn't drink so i thought maybe she had um a distemper so i googled and researched what natural ways to heal your cat from distemper and it came up collateral silver i thought wow okay so i went and gave her a half a dropper full and within 24 hours she was drinking water again and then she was eating and i was like wow so i i kicked her on that regimen and of course i lowered it you know uh gave her a couple of drops you know after a day or so and um and she continued to get better and i thought wow hallelujah this is just amazing and then about three years ago um we have a dog and um we live out in you know in the country and uh we have a lot of barbed wire fence yeah we have fencing and everything on our property and she got 
she got cut pretty bad. I mean, the wound was just. Well, you, you think about three it. or four inches on yeah. her belly. It was on her belly. Yeah, and it was just on the kind side of, of her stomach and laid her belly open, yeah. and you can see the the white of the meat mm -hmm. of her belly. So yeah. we got a spray bottle and put the silver in that, and we sprayed it on her at least twice a day. Within a week, you could actually see everything just closing up. It was just, it was like a miracle. I mean, it was just amazing. And, and I was just like, wow. never got infected. Never got infected. Um, I think, and and to this day, we still put silver in in their water, water bottles, yeah. and we we, give, water we even give it to the chickens um, in their water. Um, just you know, like. 10 drops, you know, in a big container of water for the chickens and a few drops, you know, for the dogs and cats. But um, it really believed that it keeps them well and it also kills parasites. So that's where we first started seeing things. And then, um, of course, when we have the grand boys up here, um, if they start getting a sniffle, I just spray a little bit of it in their mouth and under their tongue and have them hold it for about 15 seconds and they swallow it and um, it helps keep your immunity up, you know, healthy. Um, there's so many great benefits that yeah. silver does. For and, by, and by no means this is not medical advice mm -hmm. because our animals might have just healed uh, naturally or they might have healed by us just praying for them and mm -hmm. such. I know we had a chicken that was very lethargic at one time and uh, we I grabbed the chicken and held its uh, beak open and you, you dumped a, bun a whole dropper full or two uh, down her throat. And next day it was almost like she we did she was a different chicken she wasn't mm -hmm. uh, lethargic or anymore so uh, again so we've had some amazing things uh happen with uh what we've seen with silver you know uh with her animals but the uh, biggest thing um with tanya uh you know back during uh the start of the 2020 we were it was i'll let you tell the story i, I can't remember when you started getting pain or whatever but uh Kind of real quickly, let's just uh, try to give your okay. testimony and and on what happened with you back in 2020. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> one thing I do want to say is if you really want to look into this silver, you need to do your own research. You know, don't listen to us, you know, um, but we're just here to give our testimony for your benefit, you know, to let you know what it can do for you. And I'm not giving anything of the praise of the silver. I'm giving all these steam in praise to Yahuwah. All honor to him. He Hallelujah. is the one that heal, heals all. He's the only one that can heal all. Um, so it was, it was a couple of days before we went to Passover down in South Texas. And right, East Texas. Down around South Jasper, Texas. Jasper, Texas area. Yeah. So um, we had a house full of people, and and I was a co big coffee drinker back then. And um, so I was up, you know, the majority of the day drinking coffee and not enough water. And and I don't know why I let myself get that way, but I did at that time. And um, and I had people here, and I was, you know, preparing food and you know packing, you know, and just really busy. And um, so the night before we left, I started getting a pain in my my left side of my back. And I thought maybe it was a UTI or something. And um, so I started drinking lots of water and cranberry juice. And I started taking the caudal silver. Well, we the next day we get packed up. And I felt a little bit better. And we went down there. And, and uh, later on the next day, I started feeling kind of under the weather again so I started kept drinking the cranberry and water and stuff and a little bit of silver and um so um well to you then, that one day was so bad you didn't even come out of the well, bed yeah then the, there one day um the day after Passover which was Sabbath um I stayed in bed the whole day uh on a heating pad and I started drinking a gallon of water a day. And so 
to this day, I still drink a gallon of water a day. And I just had to flush all that stuff out of my body, whatever it was that was in there, what was infected or whatever. And so um, I felt better the next day after that. And so we came home and I thought everything was good. A few weeks go by and um, and I noticed my my right side, my right side of my, my abdomen was kind of swollen. And I thought, wow, you know, I wonder what's going on. So it was, I wasn't really hurting or a lot of pain, but I told Kevin, I said, whatever this is, it's been like this for a few days. We might need to go to the doctor tomorrow and find out what's going on. So sure enough, before I got out of bed that morning and my eyes open, the father just gave me a word. He gave me the coat of many colors. And I was like, okay. So he was telling me the whole time that no matter what, he had his coat of protection on me. I was protected. And no matter what happens, I would be okay. And I believe it. I believed it wholeheartedly. And um, so we get up and get ready to go. And well, I, Kevin was ready, but I got up and got ready to go and everything. And we leave the house. But as we were driving down the road, he's Googling uh, stuff about juicing and about getting a juicer. And he was going to go ahead and go to the, the health store to get some more collateral silver while I was right. in the clinic. Yeah, and I was also trying to find out, you know, what was it? What could it be just depending on where what, what, where the location was and where the pain was coming from. So mm -hmm. anyway, and we don't have a family doctor. We haven't had a family doctor in, oh my, uh, years. 30 years, yeah. I guess. So um, uh, We're not we, one to go to the doctor if anything happens. Uh, so, so we went to a place called, uh, yeah, well, it's just emergency cleaning. I won't give the name. And uh, and anyway, it was at the height of 2020 at where everybody was, uh, you know, wearing face diapers and such. And uh, anyway, go ahead, Tanya. So I get in there and um, the doctor first wanted, the first thing she offered me was morphine. And I thought, wow, <laughs> no, ma'am, I'm not in that much pain. And so she's like, okay. So she said, well, we will, we will have to do a CT. And I'm like, I never had a CT before. And I was like, wow, okay. And I really didn't want a CT, but, you know, I really wanted to see what was going on. And um, and, so and what was funny about that, too, she could have simply diagnosed you by, by physical examination and could have t told you what it was. But, but anyway. And she never touched my body. Right. This is so weird. She yeah. never, never touched even, you. Never touched me. So that's how wicked the medical system is. They were just, and it's so sad. But anyway, what happened was get in there and get the CT. And these people were in there, they were young and they were asking me all these questions. Are you on the medications? Are you, you know, have you ever been in the hospital? And I'm like, no, no, other than having my children. That's the only time I've been in the hospital. And they cannot believe that I was on any type of medication. Or anything. I mean, they just, it really blew them away. <laughs> and I was just like, okay. But so they did the CT and then come to find out the doctor comes back into my room laughing and she's like, I'm like, what's going on? And she's like, you have an acute appendicitis. And I said, okay. And I just thought maybe she would recommend me, you know, some antibiotics and go home. But no, she says, um, you will have to go to the hospital and get it taken out. And I'm like, what? I couldn't believe it. And so she asked me what hospital. So I told her the hospital. And so they had the room ready for me. Me and Kevin, uh, well, Kevin was on the phone with, with me and the doctor. And because of course I couldn't go in with you because of the, what the craziness that was happening. Exactly. That year. So he's, he's Googling natural ways to heal an acute appendicitis. And um, so I get out of there and get all my records and we go to the hospital. We walk in, in the ER room, there's nobody in there. And here they were, have, they were lying on the media saying the rooms were full, the hospital beds were just, every room was full and, you know, just, just, Scaring the people. It was just crazy. So, That's the least amount of people I've ever seen in an emergency room. Yeah. So we're sitting in there and 
I wanted to talk to the doctor face to face just to get a second opinion and ask him exactly how he's going to do the procedure and you know I want to get the gist of things well before I sign any papers um, me and Kevin went over and talked and at that time the head nurse came down and I told her I wanted to talk to the doctor face to face and she's like oh man no she said he won't be here till you actually go into the room to have surgery and I'm like, do what? I'm mm. like, mm -mm. I want to talk to him face to face. And so me and Kevin went over and sat down and Kevin's like, what do you want to do? And I said, well, and I told you what I'd researched and I'd found mm -hmm. several videos and there was three natural ingredients that they used. Uh, people that had bending over acute appendicitis uh, where they were in terrific pain and, uh, and had alleviated their pain with these three different products and such. So I told you products. about those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The natural products. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. So he says, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I don't want to have the surgery. I want to go home. And I said, I trust that who is going to heal me. <laughs> and believe. I believe he's going to heal me and he will. And there was another way besides doing this medical procedure. So we left the hospital. Well, before we trust. did, before we did, the head nurse tried to give scare us, said if she walks out of here and that thing bust, uh, that she could die. And I just thought in my head, I, I've known thousands of people over my life and I've known, you know, some of them have died, but I've never known any of them to die from a busted appendix and such. So I uh, know some have had a busted appendix, but they didn't die. So it was just a, it's fear mongering and fear mongering is a main thing uh, that goes along with the, our daily lives today where they try to do that. So we took off and uh, Tanya hadn't ate all day. So we stopped by a deli and she had a, we couldn't even get a salad that day cause they, they shut down the salad bar. But they would allow you, they would cook you, what did we have, some soup? Mm -hmm. They cooked us some soup and stuff. So we came home and, and, and one of the, here's how Yahoo works. A year before this at Passover in Destin, Florida, we had one of the largest get togethers we've ever had in Destin, Florida, meeting new people. And one of the new people we met just so happened to have her own business where, uh, she made collateral silver. And during that, week in Destin, Florida, because, you know, I, I happened to get a severe sunburn, a bad one. And, um, anyway, because she was there, she had some product on her and she offered some salve that had caudal silver in it. And I'm going to tell you what, I've never seen a sunburn not hurt as bad as I had at that particular, um, time. Uh, so that kind of sold me on the caudal silver for my own for my own uh, self at that time, what it could do as far as uh, externally for you. So, but anyway, we got home from the deli. We stopped, I think I stopped by and bought some stuff on the way home. Um, mm -hmm. And um, there was three ingredients um, that came up. Collateral silver was one, and we already had collateral silver in our medicine cabinet. Um, the other one was fenugreek seed. I didn't even know what fenugreek seed was, and I didn't even know it was in the town of Texarkana. So I ended up coming home and going to Longview mm -hmm. and, and getting fenugreek seed at a health food store there. And then also castor oil. And I can't remember if we had castor oil on hand, we but mm -hmm. we, we did by what Tanya's saying. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there's three types of things that we used. And so we got her home. We called Jennifer, um, asked her, you know, uh, the lady we met in Florida, we asked her, uh, how much should we dose? And, uh, you know, your normal caudal silver is going to give you one teaspoon in the morning and one teaspoon in the, uh, evening, I believe, uh, for your, your daily dose. And, uh, if you want to take it on a regular basis, well, Tanya was drinking right at 20 ounces a day. Um, and, um, so it was a lot of, it was a lot of caudal silver compared to what we'd ever done before. So, uh, first thing I did when we got home, I said, Tanya, I don't even want you picking up a broom, which was going to be hard for her to do. But I said, just go to bed. When you get up, 
don't do anything but come in here and study scripture or, or whatever. Just sit and relax and I'll take care of everything else. So for four days, that's what we did. We uh, ju ju juiced her up on uh, 20 ounces of a clodal silver a day. Uh, we made fenugreek, I made fenugreek tea uh, twice a day for her, one in the morning, one in the evening. She'd drink it. And then at night, uh, we did uh, castor oil and we put the castor oil on a kind of like a linen or flannel uh, cloth. And I took saran wrap with medical tape and I wrapped it around her where she was hurting at. And uh, we put a heating pad on it. And uh, the qualities of castor oil, it's amazing what castor oil can do. Y'all need to take a look at castor oil too. And uh, the healing, uh, its ability to pull out toxins out of your body and such. So anyway, so we did those three things. And in four days, she had no pain. And uh, so we called her friend in Florida and she said, well, uh, you know, maybe cut the uh, dose in half. So what Tanya was doing initially was she was doing uh, two ounces an hour every hour for the first four hours a day and then one ounce every other hour after that until she went to bed. So that was about 20 ounces. Well, she cut it in half and we were taking about one ounce every hour and then um, a half an ounce every other hour after that so it cut it down to about half and uh so we in the meantime i'd i'd called another town and uh, just i'd got on google and and searched for some uh medical facilities that had a very um good uh, reputation so i called one that had a high reputation and they they didn't actually have what we needed to do, but they referred me to another facility and said, Mr. Strange, yes, this is where you need to take your wife. So we got an appointment exactly 14 days to the day that she got um, diagnosed with acute appendicitis. And, uh, and the reason I'm telling this part of it, I, <laughs> I was a big part of this, so I, I can remember. Tanya remembers some things that I don't remember, but this part I really remember. So we get to the facility. They take us back to the room, and um, anyway, uh, the lady that sees us, she's a nurse practitioner, and um, we take her files. There's a CD that we took in and showed her, and and um, you know, and, and just let y'all know, you know, a regular appendix, uh, getting your appendix removed is anywhere from a thirty to forty thousand dollars surgery, and that was four years ago. No telling what it is today. But it was thirty or forty thousand dollars for a basically a afternoon um, surgery, and uh, and now I start thinking about that doctor laughing when you can't. She came out and said, you know, she was laughing when she told you you had a cue. She was probably laughing at a enjoy that she was fixing to make you know a, a referral fee off of uh, referring you to get to surgery and such. So anyway. Um, we get in there, the doctor looks at her files and said, yeah, you, you had a, a acute appendicitis. Uh, she said they probably jumped the gun, though, as far as wanting to do surgery right away. Um, she said, how much pain were you in? She, and Tanya said, well, I was in pain, but I, it wasn't, you know, nothing I, uh, bending over pain. I just knew something was wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, and she, uh, she said, um, she said, well, what did y'all do? We told her about us walking out of the hospital. And she said, what'd y'all do? And, and I told her I got on YouTube and, and, and found three ingredients that was kind of common on a few of those videos that all these three ingredients were mentioned of what people use for their acute appendicitis. And she, and she laughed and she says, that's funny. She says, you know what? For a year of my internship, I want to study on a naturopathic doctor. And, uh, so I spent a year. And what y'all, the three ingredients that y'all used would have been, was exactly what that doctor would have recommended uh, before he ever advised surgery, you know, for your appendix to be taken out. For, for any of y'all that might not know, your appendix is what pushes all the good biotics off into your intestinal tract for you. So without an appendix, uh, you're missing something that your creator put there to help keep you healthy, to put those good biotics inside of your your intestinal tract to keep you healthy. So, so anyway, she, she agreed with what we did. And I said, well, no matter what, I want a sonogram. I want to make, I want a picture to make sure it's clear. And she said, Miss Strange, we don't need a, we, you don't need to spend that money on a sonogram. Uh, she said, Mrs. Strange, if you get up here on this table, she says, I, I can tell you in a few minutes, whether you still have a appendix, if your appendix healed or not. 
So in this one, we learn that uh, when you have appendicitis, if you press down on the place where it hurts, it doesn't hurt anymore when you press down. It's when you let up where the pain comes, where there's more pain. And I didn't even know that after all those uh, videos uh, that are watched or I just forgot because I was so concerned about Tanya's health at the time. So she got Tanya up there and pushed on her. And that's why I'm saying that other doctor never touched her. Uh, she could have did the same thing without doing a CT and told her that it was her appendix uh, before that. Uh, but anyway, that's just how you're... Your, your medical industry operates today and thankfully there's some there's still some honest and ones that have went out and got learned and educated and got gained knowledge in a a natural way to uh, go about healing so she got a clean bill of health and um, she's been good ever since then and she does she cut down on um, I don't even think you drink coffee anymore but you drink a lot of water and you do uh, good herbal teas all the mm -hmm. time and stuff so and Tanya's always been a, a, a workout individual, and so she stays, or she's always active in her lifestyle, much more active than I am and such. So, um, uh, so she does well. So that's her testimony uh, there. And uh, we'll just continue on. I asked this question to Google, are there any clinical studies for the healing from caudal silva? So here's what uh, the AI says. Some, some claim these products can improve your immune system and fight bacteria and viruses. And they say these products can treat cancer, HIV or AIDS, um, that that C thing that came around in 2020, shingles, herpes, acne, eye diseases, and prostatitis. Uh, prostatitis, I guess that's for your prostate, uh, but little research has been done to study these health claims. So that's the problem. We don't have a lot, enough honest information or they've kept that, it's kind of like scriptures, they've kept the honest information in scripture away from us and, and put out this adulterated uh, um, different word of the scripture. So it's the same way with the health industry. And this, uh, this answer came from Mayo Clinic and such. So Guys, what we're trying to convey, do your own research. Don't listen to us. Go out there, do your own research. If you have any health issues, get online and test and prove things. And how you do that, you're, you, can, you can find the bad ones. You know when they're bad. If, if the Father gives you eyes to see and ears to hear, you're going to really truly be able to divide the truth from the lies uh, by going out. So that, that, that internet, uh, that that web out there can can catch you and, and and like a spider web and do bad things to you. But you can also go out there and it, where the scripture says, uh, uh, "Live by the sword, by the die by the sword." We can also use that uh, artificial intelligence against them and to help us um, for our for our health and our even our spiritual well being. Because if you're not if you're not uh, healthy um, physically, then you're not you're not going to be healthy spiritually. So anyway, we'll carry on here. Uh, back to alchemy again. I just wanted to highlight here the supposed science of transmutation of base metals into silver or gold. And again, it says pursuit of the transmutation of baser metals into gold. Search for the universal solvent and panacea. So keep that in mind where it's talking about these base metals as we continue on. So I asked the question, do living beings have metals in them? Yes, living be beings have metals in them, which are essential. They're essential for life and play many important roles in the body. So what are these metals? These metals are required for the body to function properly and include copper, iron, manganese, zinc, zinc sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. And, um, you know, and since we uh, met, our friend in uh, from Florida, um, the machine she was making, we uh, her caudal silver with. We ended up buying from the same uh, person that she bought hers from, and we ended up we have uh, some ability to do some of these zinc. I think we got zinc and mag uh, magnesium uh, plates, and I think we got um, what else? We got some uh, gold plates and we of course silver silver was our main thing and we've got our own silver we're making our own silver now on pennies on the dollar compared to what we were buying at the store so uh, there's these uh, inexpensive uh, ways to make your own collateral silver 
Um, but if you do want to get by your silver, we recommend our friend and we'll be glad to put you in touch with her and uh, she'll ship it in to you just like she did us. And, um, uh, and uh, she helped keep us healthy. So we're we're so blessed and thankful for having her in our life. And uh, she's, she was just truly a blessing that we got to meet her the year before Tanya had this issue. Uh, if we continue on and read, for example, copper is a transition metal that re that's required for psychological activities in mammals, while iron is a co cofactor for many enzymes and proteins, including hemoglobin. Guys, why do y'all think they're taking copper pipes out of the new homes now? You know, our old home had copper pipes. Well, we built this. If, if I knew what I knew now, we would have had it done with copper pipes. But we have plastic pipes now. And also, there used to be iron pipes. Mm -hmm. And the iron pipes had the ability. So the iron, there's another natural way you can get iron in your body is uh, cooked with iron skillets. Mm -hmm. And iron skillets are a very healthy way to cook any foods. If you're going to cook your foods, an iron skillet is a uh, way to go with it. Um, my, metal ions also interact with biological molecules like proteins, enzymes, and nucleic acids to participate in chemical processes. So all these metals, to get to where they have, there, there's a chemical process, there's an alchemy that occurs doing this, these things. So uh, this is natural. These are natural things that happen. For example, potassium and sodium help maintain resting cell membrane potential in cell-to-cell -cell communication. Mm -hmm. So, guys, if each one of our cells are in line with one another, it's just going to be help healthier for us. And you can't live without potassium and sodium. So, you know, you hear about people on low sodium diets and these heat waves come through and the people on these low sodium diets, they either have heat strokes or they, um, they die. They die sometimes. So we've just got to be real careful uh, with what we put in our bodies. Tanya, you have something to add? Yes. Coconut water is really great yep. for um, replacement for electric lights and minerals. So if you're out in the heat, if you work out in the heat in, you know, in the summertime or you get, you know, overheated, coconut water would be the best thing to drink to replace whatever electrolytes you lose because Gatorade is very toxic. Yeah. What they put in there is very, very bad for your body and your organs. So stay away from Gatorade. Get you some coconut water. Make sure it's not concentrated and it's no sugar in it. And it is really beneficial for your body. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, coconut water, they call it primary water. So any type of fruit like watermelon, cantaloupe mm -hmm. that has a lot of juice or cucumbers. I mean, we got cucumbers running out of our ears mm -hmm. uh, this year and the juice from these things are called primary water. So that water is it's they say that it, it absorbs into your cells a lot quicker and easier than regular uh, water that you get from your well and such. And, and we're blessed here that we've got a deep well. Uh, 450 feet. It is alkaline water too. Uh, so it's not acidic and, um, acidic water is not good for you. Any and well water is healthier right. than city water. Right. And if you have a well, you will have it. It is alkaline yeah. water, naturally alkaline in yeah. your body. And most of your, most of your city water, all your city waters are, chlorine. and, 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 and I'm yeah. speculating here. It, they might not all be, have chlorine in them, but most of them have uh, chlorine in them and most of them have uh, fluoride in them which are both carcinogens so mm -hmm. myself my family my father and mother both died of cancer the complications of uh, cancer in their body so uh, anyway uh, my sister chose not to go the when they found the uh, the uh, tumor on her thyroid she chose not to go that way at that point in time and she changed her lifestyle and her diet that helped she went with a higher alkaline diet and she took three herbs that uh helped and now that tumor is gone she she doesn't have a problem with it and she feels better too uh since she's changed her life the three herbs oh yeah the three herbs is uh and i actually take them now uh mm -hmm. on a daily basis and um 
It's uh, Irish sea moss, uh, burdock root, and, and bladder rack, which there's three of theirs. Um, sea moss is a great one uh, um, to take. Other cancer things, they say sirsop is a great way to do. Uh, we have a friend in Colorado that had changed his lifestyle. They gave him two months uh, to live. He had a problem with his prostate and he changed his lifestyle, started eating differently. And now he uh, just let us know about two months ago that he was in remission. So hallelujah for that. It just goes to show that uh, Yahuwah put all the things, he put, made our bodies to heal themselves. Uh, but we're because we're getting attacked by so many toxins of the world, not only spiritually, but um, physically, uh, that he get he get made all these other things to help cleanse ourselves and, and, uh, and basically detoxify our bodies uh, uh, physically and spiritually. So is there righteous and unrighteous alchemy? Well, I can I can say by the by the talk we've already had. Yes, is the answer. There's a righteous way and there's an unrighteous way so let's take a look so we go back to medicine there and i don't know if y'all caught it but a patent medicine that means a herb you cannot patent anything that's natural you can only patent things that you've chemically uh concocted and made together so uh that's what most people go to they go to a, 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 the pharmaceutical a pat and buy their patent medicines at that point in time so if we look at Revelation 18, 23, and I believe we're seeing this prophecy uh, being fulfilled right now, and it's uh, getting um, their lights getting dimmer and dimmer as we speak. And this is talking about Babylon and the confusion here. And the light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore at all, and the voice of a bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. That bridegroom and bride is us and the word of Yahuwah. That's, that's the bridegroom, the Messiah, which is the word of Yahuwah. And the bride is his people, his set apart people, shall not be hurting you any more at all. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth. For by your drug sorcery, pharmakia, and I find it interesting that pharmacy got the word harm in it. Pharmakia, all the nations were led astray. And so over the last four years, I think we really, this has been highlighted to us that um, the merchants, uh, the great ones of the earth, um, um, I won't mention the drug companies, but um, they uh, have led the nations away. So there's a quote by Hippocrates uh, called, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So uh, Tony and I try to take that not only literally with uh, what we eat. And, uh, you know, I'm looking here on this picture. we got cucumbers and broccoli. And uh, um, in fact, I ju we just we found a, a weed in our garden it just we can't keep it from growing it has like little thorns on it but it's not too bad it's not like a cactus or anything like that but it's called pigweed and um and the um the scientific name is um manthea i think is the uh uh and manthea or something like that if anybody's interested i'll send you the information on it uh, but i went out and picked some of the leaves and we uh found out man it's the the medicinal properties of that weed is unbelievable but just like dandelion you know they make poisons to, to kill dandelions in your yard and dandelions got some of the best uh, medicinal properties that there is so i took some of the leaves and brought them in to tanya and i said hey you know um they say we can put them in our salad and and um and also cook cook them like we do uh grains or or spinach or something like that so she did in her salad and and we tanya definitely uh sees a difference in how it's uh helped her gut system and everything so so we've been real big this year on trying to do a garden and we're going to try to do a fall garden so we're going to be praying to you and we ask y'all to uh you know pray f uh to him too uh that that it, it puts it uh you know we give him all the honor and esteem for what how he blessed us this year with our garden i, I mean uh we're uh, we're doing great. <laughs> we're still, I mean, we're still producing um, buckets, uh, about two five gallon buckets a day of food uh, has been average. I think I think we've had some low days, but yesterday was a high day for sure, and uh, and tomorrow will be because this being the Sabbath, we didn't pick it, so we're going to have extra large uh, things to be picked tomorrow and such. So 
Anyway, so we're letting food be thy medicine, medicine be thy food. But is Hippocrates, who was this guy? So if I looked in uh, up in Wikipedia, it says Hippocrates is credited as the first person to believe that diseases were caused naturally, not because of superstition or or mighty ones. You know, well, I, I you know Hippocrates might have been back in the first century. He was a Greek um, philosopher, and uh, and maybe back then um, their diseases were caused by what they ate. Uh, I know there's probably a lot less diseases in than there are today uh, just because of the way they ate. They probably ate more whole foods. Uh, they didn't have a lot of, they didn't have any packaged goods where you, we go in the grocery store and most aisles are just poisons and multiple uh, uh, meals in there. But always read your food labels. If you don't understand what the word means, don't buy it. Right, and the less the less mm -hmm. ingredients in there is the better for you. Mm -hmm. So there's there's some good things out there that still are packaged, but might have just two or three ingredients in it uh, that are good for you. Or if they have mul multiple ingredients, all the ingredients are natural and stuff. So, but if we today we have the problem with the mighty ones, the mighty ones today are the you know the elite of the world and what they're doing and the the toxins that they're putting you know out there in people. Um, the pharmaceuticals, uh, the 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 city water, uh, the the uh, you know what's spray being sprayed. It's almost like crop dusting on a regular basis, and how they're manipulating that. And we, you know, we just learned some new in you know that nanotechnology uh, that's that's you know that's also being known uh, that there's going to be some nano detoxification you're going to be able to do. So if you get some nano, uh, which all of us are getting affected by it. Uh, today, this nanotechnology, because of what they're doing um, and they're putting in the air, we're breathing it on a daily basis. So, anyway, so there's some things that we can do to heal ourselves. So let's but let's get back to the study. Enough on uh, that portion of our physical health. Is righteous alchemy scriptural? Let's take a look. Mm -hmm. So when I when I went to Bible Hub and punched in, Bible Hub is one of the best things to search anything with. So if you got a word you want to search for, if it's in the Bible, it's going to come up here in this uh, deal. Or even a phrase. If you want to just put a phrase in there, you're normally going to, under Bible search, it's going to come up and give you results. But here, as you can see, under alchemy, alchemy is not even listed in Scripture. So is a form of alchemy listed in scripture well i believe it is and uh, so let's take a look so one thing you can look at with alchemy i found some topics on alchemy and let's take a look at one and it's called spirit alchemy it's a, a article called quiet talks on service by sd gordon and just listen to this there is a divine alchemy whereby money may be transmuted into redeemed purified uplifted lives and that money i'm seeing is gold and silver if you think about it gold and silver can be transmuted into redeemed purified uplifted lives because we've seen the benefits of what um uh, putting electrolysis into the uh it, into water with uh, gold or um silver in it does for us there is another alchemy whereby men made of finest gold in the image of elohim may be transmuted into the basis metals. There we go back to the basis metals. And this is talking about spiritual alchemy. This is not talking about physical alchemy. When Moses coming down from the present of Elohim saw the shocking sight of the people worshiping a calf made of gold, he reproached Aaron for permitting it. Do you remember Aaron's answer? He had the gift of speech, you remember, an easy, smooth way of explaining things, yet in the light of the recited facts, the answer seems rather lame. It needs a crutch to steady it up. He said that he had put in the gold, and there came out this calf. Okay, so a great many men might fairly make use of Aaron's explanation. They have put into the crucible of life their gold themselves. Elohim's, El's finest uh, gold entrusted to their hands and under their manipulation what has come out is a veely callow calf a bull calf at that too scrub stock fit only for the axe there's the other the divine alchemy whereby man 
they put in the gold entrusted to his handling, and there shall come out life's sweet, strong, fragrant life's made anew in the image of their maker. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Deuteronomy 9.21, And I took your sin, the calf which you had made, and burned it with fire, and crushed it, and ground it very small, until it was fine as dust. And I threw it threw its dust into the stream that came down from the mountain. That dust was a powder. So keep that word in mind, powder. And I threw its dust into the stream that came down from the mountain. Man, there's so much spiritual mm -hmm. and figurative language going on there, guys, mm -hmm. of what that fire is, how he, cr what crushed it, and uh, what ground it into small pieces, uh, fine as powder, and threw its dust, that fine powder, into the stream that came down from the mountain. There's so much symbology there. Mm -hmm. Zechariah 13, 9, And I shall bring the third into fire. And refine them as silver is refined, and try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I shall answer them. I shall say, this is my people, while they say, Yahuwah is my Elohim. So they shall call on my honor, authority, and character, and I shall answer them. So we go back to medicine, and we look at the origin. I never showed that earlier, but medicine here, we got... In the origin, it goes back to Latin medicina from medicus, physician. So I just want to look up how many scriptures had a physician in them. And just, again, look at the, symboli simplis or the symbolism of the physician. This is not a literal physician. This is what people are doing with the word of Yahuwah. Jeremiah 8, 22. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? He's talking about the daughter, the church of uh, the tribe of uh, Judah, the assembly. Mm -hmm. So that's what the daughter is. Mm -hmm. Job 13, 4, but ye are forgers of lies. What else do we forge? You know, they forge steel swords. So you put, again, that's a, another form of bringing met different metals together and, and, and forming a knife or a, a sword or even, you know, any type of steel that they manufacture today. It's forged through the fire. So, but ye are forgers of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. So these are people that are of no value because they're liars. They don't tell the truth. Then Mark 2, 17, and hearing this, Yahushua said to them, those who are strong have no need of a physician. Okay, get this. But those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. So the sinners are the ones that need the physician, and the physician is the word of Yahuwah, and we'll get that right here. Luke 4, 23, and he said unto them, ye will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. So Yahushua HaMashiach, the Messiah, the word of Yahuwah, that is our position today. And it's it's in between those pages from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. All that, that's our Messiah. That's what we can, that's how we can reach out and touch them today is to get in there. And that's our position today to get into that word. What is the philosopher's stone? I didn't know what the philosopher's stone was. Did you know what it was before this video? Did you? Kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of. Okay. Well, you, you knew something I didn't know. So Philosopher's Stone, if we look it up here in Britannica, it says, uh, in Western alchemy, an unknown substance, also called the tincture or the powder, sought by, there's that powder, sought by alchemists for its supposed ability to transform base metals into precious ones. Remember, humans have base metals in them. And if we get set apart, we become precious ones. Mm -hmm especially gold and silver, as that scripture read earlier. I'll refine them as silver and try them as, as gold is tried. Alchemists also believe that the elixir of life, there's that word again, elixir of life, could be derived from it. He goes with so, the fire to turn into gold, which is his living word. Yeah, so I didn't even know what I didn't even know what philosopher meant. So when you look up the origin of it, 
it means a lover of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So that works both ways. That could be, you could be going after unrighteous wisdom, which there's many people that do that today. Uh, uh, you know, the wisdom of how to, you know, make people sicker. That way you can sell more goods or, or to make your, um, make your animals grow bigger, quicker and stuff. That type of wisdom, mm -hmm. like chickens, they can grow a full grown chicken in four months. They can make chickens now lay eggs on a regular basis. And that's not natural to a wild uh, land bird. If you research land birds, no, typical land birds lay their eggs within a certain period of time. Like I think the turkey does it like in a 20 or 21 day. They call them clutches. So they'll, they'll lay an egg. Uh, multiple times uh, through the, those days and they call it a clutch, but then they don't lay for a long time after that. So the chickens that we have today have been genetically modified. And I don't know if there's a chicken out there, it's, uh, you know, that hasn't been touched. And uh, I, I know eventually if you went back to Yahoo and just let the, uh, let well enough be alone and let the, the chickens be, what they were intended to be from the beginning, they would go back to that stage. They would heal and, and go back to the way you hood. But I didn't know philosopher meant lover of wisdom. So righteously, anybody that wants to get into the scriptures and learn the word of Yahuwah, then they're, they're a lover of wisdom. They're a philosopher. So let's continue on with that thought and uh, process here. So we're going to look at the tincture and the powder here. So tincture... When I searched that in, um, the only place I found it was in Mark 15, 23. Uh, it means to be like myrrh or to mingle with myrrh, which myrrh, myrrh is the essential oil. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, though, if you look down here at the HELPS word studies, um, it's also that it's, it's, it's connected to that one church in the seven churches of Revelation, that's Smyrna. Smyrna, uh, properly mingled with myrrh, a bitter herb given to help deaden the pain of criminal sentence to crucifixion. So here's the thing that I always misunderstood until today. A wine mixed with gall was commonly offered to dying criminals as a pain deadener. This cheap wine was routinely given to people condemned to brutal ex execution. So I didn't know that. So let's continue on. So if we look at 1523 oh, in the full version here, um, it says, and they were given him wine mixed with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. So, in the King um, or the international version, it says they gave him um, mixed with gall wine. And, um, and of course he, he didn't take it. So I don't believe this is my speculation. I don't believe the Messiah took the, uh, the concoction because he knew it would deaden the pain. And he, he wasn't, he wasn't going to do that to deaden the pain. He, his purpose was uh, to down that cross by a certain amount of time and um, so that's why he didn't take the uh, pain, because otherwise it, it would have take, taken away the pain and he it might have been natural for him to try to prop himself up. Do you have a thought on that, Tony? Yes, I, I look at this in a spiritual symbolic uh, language. So um, he didn't want to accept the mixed wine and myrrh, which is maybe man's philosophy of the word and not Yehuvah's philosophy of the word. So to me, that might be, he did not accept it. He did not want to accept other man's words. He only wanted to accept his father's word. Okay. So I see that as a spiritual symbolically sure. um, language. Just like we don't want to accept any other word except for his true word, which is the scriptures from from the olive to the top, from Genesis to Revelation. So yeah. that might, the, the mixed wine might be someone else's word that was given to him. Right. And he did not take it because he knew it was not of his heavenly father, Yahuwah. It was someone else's word. Interesting. That's how I see it. Okay. Maybe yeah, and that's my speculation. Well, we're told we can only the true worship is only to worship Yahuwah in the spirit and truth. So this has to it's a spiritual journey that we're on. So you know, any time we can try to look and find the spiritual significance of that verse, mm -hmm. I believe you you know possibly might be uh, uh, onto something good there. So let's continue on. So this word gall, I always thought the gall came from your liver, is the bile that came out of your liver, and that's what the I thought. Ladder. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought that's what they were. Yeah, that's. Uh, I thought that's what they were. Uh, they were given a gall from animals or men mixed with the wine. But watch this: when you do, when you do the deeper research into the words when they were first used in scripture, watch here. Etymology: the excretions on a plant caused by the deposit of insect eggs, especially on an oak leaf. From Latin gala, oak gall, which is of uncertain origin, they were harvested for for use in medicines. And then, of course, inks and dyes. But I find that interesting. They were harvested for use in medicine. So could Yahuwah say, well, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to take of it, too, because it's uh, it's uh, the excretion from a uh, from insect eggs. Uh, that could have been possible uh, way too uh, that he did, he denied it. So I find that fascinating that insect eggs uh, are are gall back when it was originally, uh, and that was late 14th century. So that was that was before uh, that was about the time John guys like John Wycliffe was translating them, the scriptures from uh, the Hebrew and Greek over into the English. So going back to alchemy again on the etymology. I want to take a look here at this Greek uh, word, uh, kamea, I believe, uh, was probably the original being first applied to pharmaceutical chemistry, which was chiefly concerned with juices and infusions of plants. So let's look at it. The Greek term chemia, and it's spelled a little bit here, but I just Googled it and I wanted to ask it for its meaning, meaning cast together, may refer to the art of alloying metals, which that's true. Um, you know, I'm sure it had something to do it, but if we look at ourselves as having metals in them, us ourselves, mm-hmm. um, that might have some symbol, sim, uh, some symbolism going on in the scriptures mm-hmm. from root words. Um, I don't know how to say that kuma, I guess fluid, uh, and also from keo, I pour. So fluid, I pour, uh, etymology of chemistry, uh, Wikipedia is where I found that. So. When we talk about casting things together, look here, and it's in this Ecclesiastes, also a popular song that was uh, done by a band back in the day, A Time for Everything, and they did a song about it. Forever matter, there is an appointed time, even a time for every pursuit under the heavens. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for battle and a time for peace. So going back to the fifth one, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones. We are the stones and we gather at his appointed times. Right. And there are certain stones yes. that we've gathered with in the past that it was it was time to throw away mm-hmm. those stones and, and gather other stones. And so this is part of your journey. Uh, some of the, you know, we're all stones, whether you're righteous or unrighteous, mm-hmm. uh, stones are, uh, connected. If we're made in the image of Elohim and, uh, and the Messiah was called, uh, a stone, then we're all stones. We're, we were made in that image. So, uh, so we got to look at stones in the symbolism that it's used in. So it's not talking about literal stones here. It would make no sense. There's a time to pick up a rock and throw it away, you know, yeah, and then there's sense. a time to gather rocks. You know, well, I guess, I guess when you're not doing your rock garden, you need to throw throw away the the rocks, and then if you're doing your rock garden, so anyway. But go ahead. And on three, where it says a time to kill, it doesn't mean a literal killing. It's the killing of yourselves, of your spiritual that you were before, yeah. before you became the spirit of. In you're, Yahuwah. you're the slaughter offering. Mm-hmm. Yep, you're That's a, the, the morning and evening sacrifices. Yep. So a time in the morning and evening. Mm-hmm. Yep. Is to, uh, and if you don't and know what a slaughter offering is, we won't get into it too far, but it's basically just getting into the scriptures and meditating on Yahuwah's word. And that's, you know, if you look up Palal, the Hebrew word for pray, um, in the morning and evening, the morning and evening prayers, 
It means to judge. So we're supposed to go through them scriptures and study them out and then judge and figure out what he's uh, trying to tell us because he says in Proverbs 25 too, it's up to me to hide the matter. It's up to kings to search the matter out. So if we want to be kings in the kingdom, we've got to do these things. So there's a time that we're supposed to kill ourselves. And and and, and I mean, in a sense of get rid of the things um it's holding us back from holding us word. back from his word and that's the time that we're going to be healed yeah. because when we're healing in his word that's our time that he's giving us to be healed right. hallelujah right yeah and you could look at all these mm -hmm. we could this we could, could go on and on. yeah this could go on and on it could be it's a big big old fractal pattern mm -hmm. we'd never get rid of uh, done with the words uh study on this um and we'll, we'll never get uh, done with all the st studies that we want to get done before our time uh, comes to an end. Uh, but I'm going to try to get as many as we can get done before then, huh, babe? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So powder, when I looked up powder, I got a Hebrew, uh, uh, Hebrew Strong's number 81, Abiqua. Uh, goes for powder. And I found that here's one scripture. It's one occurrence in Psalms 36, only one time. And just listen to the symbolism there. Who is this coming out of the wilderness like columns of smoke perfumed with myrrh and frankincense from all the merchants fragrant powders? Go read that in context, guys. That whole song of Solomon is a parable. And so go look at it. And I'm going to tell you, you get a deeper sense of what Yahuwah is trying to tell us, what he's trying to get us to see in here. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look at the Greek and got powder, I got Greek stones number 3039. Uh, what is that? Lick my, 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 oh, lick my, um, but basically to cr I crush the powder, scatter like chaff. And I got a couple scriptures here, um, but it's basically their, their, um, cross references for one another. So I just took the one here, Luke 2018. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whom Soever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So let's take a look at this stone. Acts 4.11. This is a stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. So what the what was being quoted here was from Psalms 118.22. I believe this was Peter, if I remember right. Uh, um, he was telling them, you rejected the Messiah. Mm -hmm. That's who, and the builders, the builders was all those pharisaical minded people that they build their own stories with their own words and they don't listen to the word of Yahuwah. So if you, if you look at the word son in Hebrew, it, it means Ben and Ben is connected to a, a building. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you're putting a story together, you have to put words together. You have to build a story. So there's righteous builders out there, and then there's unrighteous builders. So the unrighteous builders, uh, they're the ones still today that have rejected the stone. And uh, again, that comes from Psalms 118.22, which is a prob it was a, was a parable in Psalms. So this is them quoting that parable right here. So that stone is the Messiah. That's who that stone is. Again, first Peter two, four through six. This is Peter writing here, drawing near to him, a living stone rejected indeed by men, but chosen by Elohim and precious. You also, we are supposed to be as living stones, living stones, not dead stones, living stones. That's why the stones cry out. We're the stones that cry out are being built up a spiritual house, a set apart priesthood to offer up. There you go. A set apart priesthood to offer up spiritual slaughter offerings mm -hmm. what I, we just talked about mm -hmm. acceptable to elohim through yahushua messiah and i failed to put the extra u in the name there but uh i i say yahushua mm -hmm. others say it differently that's okay <laughs> because it is contained in the scripture see i lay in zion a chief cornerstone chosen precious and he who believes on him shall be by no means be put to shame Oh, yeah. Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus said the master Yahuwah, see, I am laying in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a settled foundation. He who trusts shall not hasten away. Daniel 2, and both in uh, verse 34 and 35. You were looking on until a stone was cut out without hands 
and it smote the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. This is that Roman kingdom that we exist in today. And it's still, it's breaking that iron and clay to this day. It's been breaking it from the first century on. It's just people don't realize it, but his gospel has been breaking uh, that clay and iron into pieces at, ever since the first century. In Daniel 2, 45, because you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it is that it crushed the iron and bronze. Look, it's given all the uh, the original, uh, the four beasts of Daniel's uh, vision. Crushed the iron, which is uh, Rome, and bronze, which was, I believe, that was uh, Greek, the Grecian Empire. And then the clay was back to Rome. And the silver, that was the uh, Medo-Persians, I believe. And the gold was Babylon. And the great Ella has made known to the sovereign what shall be after this. And the dream is true. And its interpretation is trustworthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Zechariah 3, 8 through 10. Now listen, Ye Yehoshua, the high priest, you, that's spelled identical to the Messiah's name. That's just the English, if you look up the etymology for Jesus, you'll see it, see it takes you to this name. The high priest, which he is our high priest. You and your companions who sit before you, for they are men of symbol. For look, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. See, a branch, you have to be a tree to have a branch. Or you have to be a vine, you know, mm -hmm. to have a branch. So uh, he, he, he meets all those criteria symbolically see the stone which i have put before yehoshua on one stone are seven eyes see i, I and i believe that's the seven churches mm -hmm. if you look at revelation two yeah, through uh, uh chapter two and three mm -hmm. that's the seven churches because uh, we found another verse not too long ago it was talking about the seven churches mm -hmm. um on one stone or seven eyes see i may engraving its inscription declares you who have a host and I shall remove the guilt of that land in one day. And that land is us. Mm -hmm. What we have in us was the promised land. We're and and how we're getting there is we're going through the word of you to get to our promised land today. It's that spiritual land that we're mm -hmm. supposed to exist in today. In that day declares you who have a host, you shall invite one another under the vine, there's that vine, and under the fig tree, there's that tree. So that fig tree has branches and that vine has branches, and he was called the branch up here. So Tanya and I, we love righteous wisdom, and we seek spiritual truth from the philosopher's stone. And we believe that philosopher's stone is our Messiah, yes. the word of Yahuwah. We invite you under. Mm -hmm. So that's our study on alchemy and philosopher's stone. Um, we pray that y'all yes. accept this. Um, you pray about it. Uh, you go and do your own research. Don't take anything we said here today. Go do your own research. And uh, if we have any advice to anybody, start looking for the symbolism of the language. And because he really, he does tell us uh, true worship is the worship in spirit and truth. So we've got to connect to that spiritual um, thing, not that fleshly thing. The fleshly thing is not going to get us there. And that's what, so many people have been confused with over the centuries is the fleshly way of worship. And it, it all comes back to being spiritual and then seeking out the truth and stuff. So, um, Tanya, you have any final words that you'd like to quickly, uh, provide? Just always stop, look and think when you're searching out the words wholeheartedly in his love and his shalom. Yeah. Yeah, just slow down, mm -hmm. take your time, seek out each individual word, even if it's a one verse. One verse can take you uh, an hour or two to go through every word in it and try to get a gist of what each one of them words are. So uh, anyway, seek it out, guys. Seek it out. We we uh, we that's we pray for each one of y'all to do that because the life that you begin to the spiritual what awakening and the and the peace the shalom that comes mm -hmm. into your life at that point in time it's almost you know the the word of yahuwah is your garment so it's it protects you from all these things so um so he is our stone and and tanya and i are philosophers so we love wisdom and we love wisdom from that stone mm -hmm. and that's the stone that we're going to stay with others 
are going to go out there and look for the unrighteous um, stones out there uh, that are out there to this day. And so I, ho I hope you get a better sense of what alchemy is and, and what the Philosopher's Stone was because I didn't even know what the Philosopher's Stone and I really didn't know what alchemy was. So a lot of times when I do this video, again, I've said this before, I don't know what I'm going to run into when I start um, doing these studies, but all my studies, I want to turn them into videos because that's my best way to convey this is on, on a video and speaking to it. And, uh, and of course, um, I'm so thankful and blessed that I've had this wonderful friend of mine for 45 years now. And, um, and, um, so we're almost 45 years. Yeah. We, we're not going to get technical about it, but it's been a big part. It's been the most part of our lives, yes. uh, for sure. So, um, anyway, and as always, huh? I'm so thankful. And as I always do, we're going in this I'm with sorry. a big, oak, um, uh, we're going to blow our trumpet out to you, huh? And we're going to keep a little quiet because we're in the house right now. And uh, didn't go into the closet today. We thought it might be a little uh, close quarters for us to do a video in my, my <laughs> recording my recording room in the closet and stuff. So, uh, 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 again, I pray the, uh, the audio turns out good too, guys. But anyway, praise to Yah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah indeed. Hallelujah. And, and y'all, the rest of y'all that's keeping the Sabbath today, uh, we pray you have uh, a peaceful rest of your Sabbath day. And we'll see y'all soon. Love y'all. Take care. Shalom. Shalom.